All right, so those of you who don't know who Paul Vixie is, turn to the person next to you and ask them. If you, no, I, I'll actually. Yeah. Um, I was, uh, in terms of a short introduction, uh, because this group more or less almost everybody knows uh, as much or more about Paul as I do, uh, I thought I could just make stuff up um, and see. So I came up with uh, several, several interesting ideas. So one of the things I was going to uh, say is that Paul Vixie actually invented the idea of a packet. So prior to that, People weren't sure. They had this idea that we were going to move information around, but nobody had thought of putting it in a packet. And that was Paul who did that. The other one was back in the early days. Some of you remember this. In the early days of the byte wars, it was Paul who actually convinced everyone that eight was the correct number of bits in a byte. <clears throat> now, there were some people. There was the 10-bit, and there was the 11. There was a 12-bit. It didn't make any sense. And Paul just put down his fist and said, no, it's going to be eight bits. And he said it was such authority and panache that everybody believed him. And that's why we have eight-bit bytes. Um, no, none of these things are true. Uh, Paul has been involved in the internet for longer than uh, many of us uh, have been conscious, and he's going to talk to us about, um, well, certainly this morning, and he's going to be talking to us about uh, internet superbugs and the art of war. So. Thank you, Todd. Thank you, everyone. I was asked uh, by several members of the security community to keep track of uh, sort of how many of you looked up from your email to, uh, to actually listen to this. Uh, so I'll be, I'll be sort of peering out and trying to get a poll on that topic. Um, I guess what Todd didn't mention is that it's getting harder and harder to find anybody in our industry who has not been lectured to or yelled at by me on the subject of um, you know, the, the scale of morality. So when they were uh, sort of looking for a keynote speaker, I realized that the internet security industry and the, the history of the internet is starting to look uncomfortably to me like the movie Groundhog Day where you do the same thing over and over and over again, and you just seem to be stuck there. Um, so I've put some thought into why we are still doing the same thing uh, 10, 20 years later, and why we keep losing. Um, some of you have heard some of this before. Um, I want to say I've taken the unusual step of quoting some people without their permission. Uh, I think you'll see that because of the way I filed off all possible context, uh, that it's not actually an information leak. Um, if any of you, uh, either in the room or on the video, feel that I have uh, stolen your jokes and should have given you credit, please let me know. Um, so let me begin uh, by talking about antibacterial soap. Um, there are chemicals you can put into liquid soap that will kill germs. And uh, what parent doesn't think it's a good idea to have something like that in the bathroom where the kids are going to wash their hands? Uh, this stuff flies off the shelves. Costs a little more than um, soap that does not have that chemical, but people are glad to pay uh, an incremental 50 cents here or a dollar there in order to have fewer germs in their house. Uh, it's just, it's an automatic sell. And it's also an automatic bad idea because uh, it's indiscriminate. It kills all kinds of germs that uh, are probably doing you some good. Uh, if they're not doing you some good, they might be doing good elsewhere in the ecosystem, but those chemicals often pass successfully through the uh, sewer systems and uh, are killing germs long after they have been in your sink. Um, the specific thing that bothers me about the rise of antibacterial soap is that it kills the weaker germs that are bad for you, uh, leaving only the strong ones to fill that ecological niche. Um, I'm not sure that we want to train the germ population in that way, uh, but that is what we are doing. Uh, hundreds of millions of us are doing that every day. Uh, did I mention this stuff is flying off the shelves? Um, a rational act 
for one of us or a seemingly rational act does not necessarily add up to a rational act in the context of a population. In other words, it doesn't scale necessarily. Now, I did this. If you're getting a lot of spam today, I am one of the people who caused you to get so much because I was antibacterial soap for the spam industry in the late 90s. I had a lot of passion, a lot of anger about people using their networks to send me traffic I didn't want. I came up with this system, mail abuse prevention system, and that is spam spelled backward in case you're not paying attention. And it did a lot of short-term good, at least it made me feel good. It caused a lot of people who would otherwise have just rented a T3, which was then the fast kind of link on the net, and sent spam all day long to not be able to do that. And so they were frustrated. I was sued. There are many legends that are told of the supposed fortune that I once had that the lawyers have now. So not only did I lose, I am the reason that spammers now use botnets. So you can thank me for that. I made them smarter. I killed off the weak ones. I caused the ones who were determined and who were able to adjust their approach to win, drive the bad ones out of business, out-compete them, and they are the ones who are spamming you today. You all did this last year. A company called Atrevo had colo space and transit connectivity in a number of places, including 200 Paul. And we had space at 200 Paul. And I can remember for a couple of years walking by the Atrevo cage, knowing that this is where most of the botnets were being controlled from. This is where most of the payment systems for illegal transactions were being hosted. And I would just look at it and I would say, why did they get to be here? And I just had this sort of simmering rage about it. Not so much that I wanted to reach in and cut cables in their cage, because they would obviously come fix that and it would be illegal and so forth. But I just wondered, why are they allowed to operate alongside the rest of us when virtually everybody in the industry knows exactly who they are, they know exactly what they're doing, and yet they can still come in here and buy services and they can get address space that the rest of us will agree is theirs and will treat as unique. They can exchange BGP, they can exchange DNS. Why are we so open to these people? Now, having once led torch-bearing mobs to the castle and had it work out badly for me, I was not ready to go do that. Other people were, and the folks at Atrevo, of course, protested their innocence and found all kinds of friends and defenders who said, oh, I know those guys, they're fine, it's their customers that they have long-term contracts with, and so there's nothing we can do about it, please don't hurt them, they're just trying to stay alive like the rest of us. But this particular torch-bearing mob, it reached the tipping point. And when these people got disconnected by one transit provider, somebody else said, well, they can buy transit from me or they can buy transit through me if they find an intermediary or whatever. Nothing worked. The mob followed them until they were gone. So I guess, like me back in the late 90s, a lot of you felt pretty good about that. Look what we did. I'll tell you what you did is the total spam volume in 2008, which is the year this took place, did not change as a result of this. There was a trough, I admit, but the spam volume came back late in the year, and it came back strong enough that the area under the curve was the same as it would have been had we done nothing. So you certainly, we certainly did hurt some people who were profiting from spam, but the spam didn't stop. 
And the people that are sending that spam and really the ultimate profiteers behind spam made just as much money in 2008 as if you guys had done nothing. On the other hand, we don't know exactly where they are anymore because they are scattered across four continents and they show up. They are much more mobile than they were before. They have better systems of working through intermediaries than they had before. They are no longer sitting ducks. And you can no longer set up a packet trace to say, gee, if I get a DNS query from thus and so address space, then I should be on alert for other bad transactions from that address space. They got better as a result of what you did. You did not benefit from what you did. Our costs are now higher as far as coping with what they're going to do next than they would have been had we done nothing. I am wondering why I'm stuck in this Groundhog Day movie where we keep doing stuff like that. On the screen, you'll see an email message. I have underlined some of the particular protocol elements, the envelope from the from field, the to field, and the last part of the message ID in order to say that all of these things were forged. I happened to be receiving quite a bit of this form of spam during the time that I was collecting information for this talk. I also had some from the Nanog announce mailing list that would probably have been a better example for this audience, except it didn't have as much to underline as this example. The reason all of these things are forged is because in the early days of spam, people put all sorts of filters on their inbound mail or on transiting mail and said, gee, if something claims to be coming to me, it had better be from a mailing list I'm on. Okay, the bad guys figured that out and forged it. Envelope from it better match what I expect that mailing list to send. Well, that's been done. It had better be to me, not to somebody else BCC'd to me. Well, the bad guys figured that one out. The message ID had better be one that makes sense to me in some way. Now, this actually doesn't make any sense because nobody that I know of would look for a message ID that ended in VIX.com on mailing list traffic that wasn't from me. So the bad guys might be doing some overshoot on that. The point being that every one of those small incremental step functions in spam filtering educated the bad guys. You taught them that if they wanted to reach a large audience, they had to forge certain things. And I guess that's okay. I mean, it's inevitable that people will do what they can and that the rest of the population will adapt to what people can do. But you ought to be feeling a little bit stupid if any one of you ever thought any filtering like this was ever going to stop anything for very long. Stopping spam for today is not a virtue. You need to do something a little more permanent. So I have very few slides here that you can read directly. This is intended really to summarize where I'm getting to at this point in my presentation. You can't expect that the bad guys are not going to adapt to your behavior. Whatever you do becomes the new starting conditions for the next round of the game. So it will not be the case that you'll figure something out that will cause them to become aware that you don't want them to do something, and they'll get the hint and go away, and they'll say, well, they don't want me to do that. I better stop. That's not the way it works. Furthermore, these incremental step functions are an educational tool. The community that you are in conflict with, in other words, the people who want to use your networks and your computers in ways that don't meet with your approval, are getting free training from you. And that is sort of a very natural side effect of what you're doing to protect yourself on a daily basis. And I just want to drive home the point. The things that we do in the name of cost control are not actually helping us with cost control in the long run. 
um, or doing any other long, long-term good. So I want to talk about configure. Uh, there's no L. I, I fairly often mispronounce it by calling it conflicker, but there's no L. Um, this is a tweet that came out fairly early on after a press release that the Configure Working Group did. <coughs> and uh, I just want to say um, we had to do a press release. We had to let the world know that there was this thing, and it was out there, but that there was some organized opposition to it. And uh, you know, the only money that was in the Configure Working Group was marketing budgets from security companies or volunteer efforts from some extremely talented, dedicated people who uh, let their day jobs uh, swing in the breeze while they go and you know fight this kind of, uh, of, of fire. Um, so we had to do a press release because that was the reward that the companies who were allowing their people to work on this uh, needed in order to then justify the expense. Because um, it wasn't going to be a profit-making activity. Fighting these worms and so forth is, is a dead loss. Um, but the natural result was a fair number of folks said, you guys are just uh, saying the sky is falling, but it isn't nearly that bad. You know, why are you ringing the alarm bells quite so loudly? Um, I heard the same thing when Dan Kaminsky released his DNS vulnerability last year. Um, uh, folks kept saying, "Hey, I don't see the I don't see that the problem warrants the uh, the attention that you're giving it, or the press releases, or the press conferences, or whatever." Um, I have stopped worrying about this. Um, I think I don't know six seven years ago I got up here and told you all about the importance of BCP 38, and a fair number of you said, I'm not seeing any spoofed source addresses in the DDoSs that are reaching me, so why are you ringing these alarm bells? Well, uh, check again. Maybe you're seeing them now. Maybe if you had done something then, you would not be seeing them, or somebody else would not be seeing them now. So I don't worry about the, the folks who, who claim that we are overstating the dangers. Um, some people do, however. And it gets to be a little hard sometimes to get uh, companies to participate if they know they're going to be ridiculed for their for their trouble. Um, but some forms of ridicule are more entertaining than others. Uh, oh crap! Configure just ate my puppy. Hide your women and internets. Look out! Yeah, um, I was there, and um, you know we can speculate about whether the situation would have been much worse had we not acted. Uh, whether the whatever small amount of patching we've had would have been even lower if we had not rang the alarm bells. Um, so there, there will always be people who say that the problem is not as bad as uh, as we're claiming. They will usually be wrong. <coughs> so the day of the press release, um, somebody who is able to monitor the creation of new domain names. Uh, noted these, and uh, various people who were in the Configure Working Group said, uh, gee, I have a theory about how it is that the bad guys might register some of this in order to then feed people malware under the, 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 the guise of having it uh, somehow clean their systems. And so every one of these was carefully looked at to find out if it was, uh, you know, some legitimate well-known security company or whether it was some fly-by-night outfit or whether it was actual, you know, honest-to-God badware. Uh, you see that the last one has an L in it, which I thought was interesting. Um, we then listed them on a website that was the Configure Working Group's website and uh, recommended that people not visit these sites because they were uh, you know, somehow not part of the effort. They were not official and they might be bad. I didn't say that they were bad because a number of us in the working group had been sued enough times to know better than that, but um, some of the fly-by-night people got pretty outraged at us for outing them in this way. Um, 
Now, it's interesting to note, you know, this guy says he's gone to a lot of trouble this week to build a site. I don't know how much trouble you can go to in a week. Uh, those of us who had been uh, not sleeping for the last month and a half and, you know, uh, away from our families and so forth uh, might have looked at this and said, okay, so you put a week into this exactly, you know, how does this give you whining rights? But um, what I found interesting was that anything like this with, that brings public attention to some well-known name becomes a business opportunity for a bunch of people who have no real value to add, but they do want to sell some advertising or get some click-throughs or, or whatever. And um, the bad guys can count on this. To the extent that they need a strategy in order to win, which really they don't, but to the extent that they needed to think ahead and make a plan, they could plan on this type of uh, friendly fire to confuse any remediation effort. Um, you can look at the list and imagine that some of those are going to show up when people say, oh, I've heard about Configure. I wonder if I'm infected. I better do a search. I better go clean my computer. Um, so some of them were bad. Some of these actually were putting uh, pop-ups and um, key loggers and things on your computer that are honest to God malware. You can't argue about it. Uh, most of them were just people wanting to monetize the problem. Um, it's a, this, this is a drag on the system. There's nothing we can do about it. This is human nature. This is what we will do in an open system that allows people to reg register these names and do, uh, I guess, what's called search engine optimization. Um, but it, uh, it sure as hell doesn't make solving the real problem any easier. A lot of these sites, by the way, had you know, plenty of Microsoft partner logos on them, and some of them were accurate. So um, one of us made the observation that uh, since Configure used encryption in its command channel, uh, that made it very difficult for us to send it uh, commands that would shut it down or deinstall itself. Not that anybody has figured out a legal way to do that, but um, ne nevertheless, this is a botnet that was operating in the open that had enough encryption built into it that they could keep good guys or other bad guys from taking it away from them, which I thought was impressive uh, and shows that a lot of evolution and a lot of training has occurred on, on that side of the, of the wall. Uh, so anyway, one of us, could have been me, well, actually it was me, made the suggestion that uh, when some door was finally kicked in and somebody was finally put in handcuffs and their PC was carted away, uh, that the possession of this encryption key would seal their fate, would uh, you know, really prove their guilt. And um, this, was, this was the result. Um, you can tell that a lot of people were not sleeping very much during, during the months this went on. Um, one fella made a, uh, a really excellent set of tools for detecting that you were infected uh, because it turns out that the one side effect of the infection is that you could not visit certain websites. Therefore, he came up with a website that just had those websites as clickables, or not even clickables. It was fetching images from them. And uh, it was like, I don't know, I, it was as cool to me as the first time I saw Traceroute and realized that the IP TTL field could be used in that way. This was like, it was right there in front of us. You know, why didn't I think of this kind of thing? But it turned out that the companies whose logos were being fetched uh, were not universally pleased to be associated with this effort. Um, I don't know if this is, uh, seems important to anybody who isn't me, but if you're in uh, a struggle, a conflict with somebody who is opposed to you and they want something you don't want them to have or they want to do something you don't want them to do or whatever that's going to be, if you have costs they don't have, it's very difficult for you to then win the struggle. Um, 
So interestingly, I, you know, I looked at this and I said, I wonder if the bad guys have got lawyers who ever tell them that they shouldn't do something. And, you know, I'm not saying we shouldn't have lawyers. I'm saying, are we aware that when we burden ourselves with all the different things we burden ourselves with, we are uh, tying our hands, you know, we're sort of adding an extra sack of rocks to the, to, to the backpack before we try to beat somebody to the top of the hill. During the last couple of months, there's been a lot of fighting all over the world. Um, I was, I, I fell out of my chair with uh, disbelief and concern when the Pakistan government entered into a peace agreement with some armed militants allowing a change in uh, federal constitutional law and protections of, uh, thereof for a disputed region of their own country. Um, and I thought, what message does this send to the next person who is unhappy with the rule of law? Uh, now, it turned out I need not have been concerned because within a week the fighting had resumed. Um, but what this reminded me of was, uh, you know, if somebody is in an armed struggle against you, uh, you do have the option of negotiating with them and saying, gee, I hate the armed struggle. Can't we find a way to get along? Uh, I'm standing in a country that was founded exactly that way. Um, and, you know, maybe the winners write the history books, but indeed you can shoulder your way into somebody else's game if you can drive their costs up high enough that uh, they would see peace with you as preferable to ongoing, ongoing fighting. Um, you can do that, and if you can get away with it, then I guess that's fine. If you can't, then they call you a criminal, and if you can, they call you a revolutionary. Um, but I think that the credit card banks, the credit card companies and the banks who, who clear those transactions have budgeted some billions with a B of dollars per year for loss and fraud. Um, and they do this because they're, you know, they do everything they can. They'll call you if you start making, uh, if your card is used in some city you have never visited or whatever. That's, you know, they've got a fair amount of, of uh, protection, but it isn't perfect. And as you know, quite a lot of uh, money gets moved around that is not yours uh, or used to be yours before it got moved out of your account or whatever. Um, the banks often will reimburse their customers for those losses, and they have a budget for this. Um, they, they have insurance for this. They have all kinds of money that they set aside in order to cover the parts of the security problem that they can't solve on the front end. So you can, in a sense, view the bad guys as entrepreneurs who see that pile of money, they know it's there, and they want it. And uh, they, they know they have to outcompete other bad guys to get it, uh, but ultimately they don't want to leave that money on the table. Uh, so to the extent that your banks and your insurance companies are willing to essentially negotiate with the bad guys over how much loss there can be, uh, they're not doing you any favors. They might be doing you or me a favor individually by reimbursing our losses, but by setting up the system in a way that puts billions of dollars on the table for the taking by the best bad guys, uh, they are really not helping with the long term. They're, they're getting through the quarter somehow, but they are not helping with the long term certainly not going to make the uh, internet or the financial system safer for my children. Not to be outdone, um, there was a, uh, a picture of the Israeli cabinet that showed up in the front pages of various newspapers. And apparently in the mainstream newspapers in that country, that's fine, but there are some newspapers that cater to the so-called ultra-Orthodox uh, for whom women on the cabinet is a bad deal. And so they just cut them out. And I thought, 
um, they're not at war, right? The ultra-Orthodox people are not ready to take up arms and try and reclaim their country from the mainstreamers and, not, and vice versa. Uh, it's not an armed conflict, but it is a bit of a conflict. They can't be fooling anybody. They are not... Uh, the, the readers of these newspapers are not looking at those pictures and saying, oh, I'm glad there are no women on the cabinet. Uh, if anything, they're looking at the empty spots and saying, oh, I'm glad that those uh, offensive images were removed before I got to see them. And I started to wonder, um, how often does it happen in the opposition, which I guess in this case would be terrorists, but in our opposition, the bad guys who want to use our computers and our networks to, for their ends, how often do they have to hide information from each other because it's offensive? Um, you know, we, uh, we carry burdens they don't carry, right? The, 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 the criminal economy is amazingly efficient. They have clearing houses, they have um, forums, they have IRC channels, they have all kinds of things. Uh, sometimes they're poorly organized and it, it'll turn out that uh, half the population will be from security companies there to watch them. Sometimes they'll be intensely well organized, small, sort of almost like revolutionary cells. They're organized only among people who know each other by name and uh, only get together for a brief period, a single project, and then they, then they move on. Um, and all that matters to them is what you can do and how much you want to charge them for doing your part of some operation. And then they're on to other stuff. They have no burden of the kind that we have with, well, should we do a press release? Or, well, would this information be offensive to Microsoft, given that their system is the one that was compromised or anything like that? Um, how much of our superior forces are dissipated in uh, just coalition management. The bad guys don't have to do. I could have quoted this from NSPSEC. I could have quoted this from any of the configure mailing lists, uh, any of the other various secret handshake mailing lists where somebody will say, I'm seeing some interesting traffic from IP address thus and so. Does anybody know anything? And then four or five people will send a message that is just like this one. Nothing exciting here. Sorry. And I'm thinking, what if the person you're, who has the information isn't on the mailing lists that you asked on? What if they're on vacation? What if it's a whole long list of what ifs? Uh, this is not a very effective way to find out what other people know. Um, how do you know that your question is not uh, also being viewed by the bad guy who can then cease operations on that particular IP address. Um, this, is, this is hopeless. This, I, every time I see one of these go on, I just want to, I don't know, I want to come here and you know, belch about it. Um, we cannot win if this is going to be our, our tool. It's also important to note that the uh, person who sent this reply was either a passionate volunteer who was uh, letting their day job swing in the breeze while they did this, or they were being paid out of the marketing budget for some security company, or they are an academic who is working, through, working their way through a, maybe a multi-year grant that will end soon. So in no case where uh, this actually did any good, which I think I said it can't uh, in the long term, in no case that it does do any good will it do any lasting good because all those people will move on. There is no organized system for answering questions of this kind. So um, Configure, here's an L again, uh, Configure did its, uh, I guess, marshalling. They, they marshaled the botnet around the idea of domain names, which they would compute sort of along the lines of a, a hash chain, a long list of random names that each one was related to the one before. Um, 
that meant that they could use the current date to generate some names. Uh, and they would then, every bot would look up those names to find out if it could fetch the next version of the, of the botnet binary, you know, the, the malware, from that website. Uh, and of course, that binary had to be cryptographically signed. And somebody told me it's a pretty long key, so the likelihood of us guessing that or, or reconstructing that key is real low. Um, the first version used 250 names per day, um, which we, uh, the, the people who wanted to respond to this and keep the botnet under control, uh, said, well, 250 names a day is, is a lot. That's, that's hard. Uh, but various people, and here, I, if I was wearing my hat, I would take it off to Rick Wesson of Support Intelligence, um, just paid, I just bought them, just bought the damn domains. Um, and so, you know, various other people also chipped in and bought some domains. And it was even somewhat useful if you could buy those domains. There was a bit of a market in those domains, in fact, and a little bit of competition as to who was going to get them. Because if you could uh, register the domains, then all the botnets or the, the bots in the botnet would be contacting your server, and you could then get a list of the IP addresses that were infected in that particular hour, um, and then somehow you would use that. And I don't know exactly how you would use that, but it was considered good to have. Um, so the operators of this botnet still had their original infection vector available to them, which was a combination of drive-by downloads and, uh, for whatever reason, USB keys were part of the infection vector also, uh, boot blocks and so forth that the operating system would, would load automatically. So they had their original infection vector um, still available to them when we started responding to them by essentially camping onto all of their names. So the next version used 50,000 names per day. And uh, that was them more or less challenging us to uh, go buy them, go see if we're willing to pay that much of, you know, whatever the wholesale cost is, five bucks per year per name. Um, fortunately, ICANN stepped up and uh, put us in touch with all of the different top-level domain. There were 110 country codes that were uh, involved in this. Um, and several of them have got uh, second-level domains, like I don't know if UK was on the list, but you could imagine that uh, co.uk is where the registrations would have occurred. So there were 116 different domain names that were used uh, to, as parents for these random names. Um, and we had a month to get in touch with the 110 countries that were responsible for those 116 domain names. And I threw in the towel. I got to say, I just looked at that and said, okay, we lost. All right, we, the, in the first round, we won. In the second round, we lost. And so it goes to show that sometimes, I, this is hard for some of you to believe, sometimes I don't drink enough coffee. Um, this uh, was done between ICANN and various members of the Configure Working Group and phone calls and plane tickets and email and so forth. All of the affected country codes agreed to participate by either registering the names and pointing them at our name servers so that we could collect information about the botnets, or by blocking the names and flagging them so that if anybody tried to register them, you could, uh, uh, we would know immediately who it was and what stolen credit card they had used and you know, perhaps send people over to kick their doors in and uh, shackle them. Um, so that was huge. I was very impressed. And uh, I, have, I have not always had wonderful things to say about ICANN in, during their history, but I will say they really stepped up and did some good things uh, by coordinating that part of the effort. Anyway, um, the next part of the game, therefore, got to be, uh, well, we better look at every one of these names every day, not only today's names, but names for the next week, and make sure that some bad guy hasn't camped onto one early in a way that uh, all they have to do is wait for the clock to tick over to that point, and all of a sudden they will get control of their, of their botnet. And we're talking about half a million to a million to a million and a half infected computers. So um, 
certainly it's one of the biggest single botnets that uh, has ever hit the papers. And it was, in our opinion, uh, those of us who worked on this, it was very important. It was uh, really crucial to keep the bad guys from getting full control o o over this, this net. So a lot of ma mail messages, like the one on, on the screen now, came about. It said, um, we've got some pre-existing domains. What are we going to do about them? And what that meant was somebody already had the random string that Configur was going to choose for a certain day. Uh, and we would then do a lot of work looking at the website, looking to see how, how long ago was this registered. We figured if it was registered two years ago, it couldn't be part of the current effort. Eventually, we found a couple that were insecure, SQL injection and so forth, so that even though they were very old, they were subject to having malware inserted into the website in the place that the binary, the, the malware, would then go look for it. Um, so, uh, you know, what you're supposed to get, the image you're supposed to have in your, in your head looking at the, the, this particular quote on the screen is a bunch of us running around with our hair on fire for months. And a fair number of what we found were other good guys, and this was our way of meeting them. In other words, those of us who knew that we were working together on this problem were able to say, by the way, the name server I'm using when I capture one of these names is as follows, and then you could sort of cross them off the list. But if you found one that was registered recently to a name server that was not on your so-called whitelist, uh, then it was like, oh my goodness, the bad guys have gotten, gotten in, you know, we're about to lose control of the botnet. But then it often turned out that uh, that wasn't true, or in the case that's on the screen right now, it would be that uh, we were trying to do population samples by looking at the DNS query traffic, and then it would turn out that a fair number of the queries that we were getting were not from bots, but they were from other good guys. And again, other good guys that we met by seeing their queries, picking up the phone and discovering that they had a contract with some government somewhere to go measure the size of this or, or go, go do some work on it. So I guess there was a good side benefit that we got a chance to meet other people who were like-minded that we had no, no ties with before this, but uh, it also meant that we had a lot of administrative paperwork to be done. Todd, how am I doing on time? Okay. Uh, and this is an administrative burden that the bad guys certainly don't have. This came up a lot. Um, there were so many people dumping so much information into the various mailing lists where this was taking place uh, that the discussions, the debates, the philosophic rantings, usually from me, and the reports uh, became sometimes hundreds of messages a day. And a number of people said, can you please take, and this, this comes up on the Nanog mailing list uh, fairly often also, can you please take this to another list so that I can read only the part that's important to me? Uh, at last count, there are seven such sublists. All of them have too much traffic on them. Uh, again, I have to wonder if the bad guys have anything like this burden when they're trying to launch one of these attacks. So um, a number of the companies who was involved uh, in this all had to do sort of follow-up press releases and blog postings and things like that, talking about various things. And again, it's because generally it is the marketing arm of these companies. Uh, when they're fighting a botnet, they are not serving their customers directly. They're serving their shareholders. Um, and so, you know, dancing with who brung you uh, meant that a lot of people had to disclose a lot of stuff. And then there would be this fight that would happen internally. Why did you disclose that? Now the bad guys know that we know it. And other people would say, well, it's obvious that we know it, um, and, and so forth. And um, I guess cooperation is hard to come by, even if there isn't you know, a fire raging at your feet. But um, I keep asking myself, as I go through uh, this year, um, is this a cost that only we on our side of the wall have to pay? Or are the bad guys paying a similar cost? This would be one where the answer would be no. 
Here's a question. Do bad guys cancel their meetings because it's a holiday in the United States? Do bad guys take holidays? So this may come as a shock, but not all country code TLD registries are as big as co.uk. Right? A lot of you know people at Nominet, um, and you know that they're, you know, they've got couple dozen employees and they probably don't worry about the administrative expense of registering a bunch of names like this or blocking them or whatever but a lot of them are smaller than that and if you tell them they got a their share of 50,000 names per day is whatever it's going to be you know thousand names or, or 500 names uh, and that they have to just keep doing that in perpetuity uh, and that they have to bear that cost and nobody is going to help them pay for it and some of them are going to squawk um, now, I'm pleased to say that the, uh, the, the quote that's on your screen right now is uh, somebody's opinion, and they turned out to be wrong. In this case, the person who was wrong was not me, although some, uh, fairly often it is. Um, nobody has dropped out. There are some people who have, there are some CCTLDs who have switched over from registering the names and pointing them at our name servers to just blocking them because that's cheaper for them. But nobody has said, I refuse to continue. Um, so apparently the belief that this is an important containment effort uh, is still shared by uh, all of them. Um, I wonder what will happen when this becomes the new fad and there are 10 new worms a month that all use this particular technique. Um, very easy to launch this attack, very difficult to defend against it. So. You're looking at an asymmetric cost scenario. So here's a guy who is uh, stunningly good at tools and operations and understanding protocols and um, has had many thoughts about sort of how to analyze data and how to organize data and so forth. and. Um, he was talking in this particular instance about some scripts that he had written that were doing various uh, amalgamation of information. And what he said is, uh, I would be able to solve 50% of the outstanding problems in the analysis the rest of you are doing if I had time. And this is not somebody who's, uh, when they make a statement like that, you say, yeah, yeah, yeah. No, this guy really could do it. Except he's already taken, he's let his day job swing in the breeze as long as he can. And he's not funded to do this work. And, uh, you know, at some point you do have to dance with who brung you and work for your paycheck or spend time with your family or whatever. Um, and our key men, key women, our key people tend to be pretty well committed to a lot of other projects besides helping us. I wonder if the bad guys have that problem. So I got into it with somebody on the more general problem of uh, takedowns from CCTLDs for phishing sites or you know whatever it's going to be. A lot of people like to worry about child pornography because that is just about the only thing on the web that is illegal everywhere. Um, but it doesn't matter. If there's some website somewhere that can only exist as long as a name, certain domain name exists, then you want to be able to go to somebody and say, look, you're in charge of the parent domain. Could you please remove the one that is bothering me? And uh, not only is it important to be able to do this, you have to do it at any time of the day or night. And they need to be able to go look at it and make a, a determination and take an action at any time of the day or night. You can't let this wait until Monday, because by that time, often the entire campaign is over. And this guy decided that it was time for me to learn the facts of life, and he said, no, that isn't going to happen. It's not realistic. Can't be done, won't be done. Uh, nothing to see here. Move along. And uh, obviously, the uh, jury is still out on this. We don't know whether the opinion on your screen is, is correct or not. Uh, I will fight it for a while. Um, but I have to say that anything that depends on instant takedowns is already very difficult in a commercial environment. Once you add 
national autonomy to the mix, uh, then you're, you're really kind of pushing on a rope uh, to get any response ever, let alone to get one at any time of the day or night. And this, again, is something that the bad guys know about us. And so they are kind of building their whole campaigns around the things we can't do. So um, there is this book, The Art of War, often quoted. It's a terribly short book. You can read most translations in about two hours. Um, a fair amount of it doesn't make a lot of sense because um, it'll talk about ancient warfare uh, using, you know, metrics that uh, really don't apply here. Uh, but it is still taught in war colleges all over the world uh, because the parts that are still applicable are extremely applicable. Um, so again, you can read the thing in a couple of hours, but it will take a lifetime to understand it. Um, and there are some things in there. Uh, I happen to be looking through it for other reasons, and I happen to notice, gee, uh, here is something that the bad guys are doing that we can't do. Uh, I'm not saying the bad guys looked at this and said, gee, uh, what a great idea. Let's, uh, let's align our campaigns around the, the ideas of the art of war. I'm saying that the stuff that is killing us has been pretty well known for thousands of years. You're not, you're not being killed by rocket scientists here. Well, this is not a war. Uh, we are not governments and states. We are not generals and armies. Um, so you have to sort of see past the, some of the nouns that are used um, and, and look at the actual force vectors behind these equations. Um, I don't know what exactly to call this. It isn't a war. Um, I'll get back to what it is later, but it's a mouthful. So I'm not going to read these. Just leave them on the screen for a moment and say, um, there are some people who run the HoneyNet Alliance that are heroes of mine because they practice this particular type of deception. Um, the rest of us don't. Uh, the rest of us are sitting ducks. And any of you who has sort of just had to stand there and take it and go toe-to-toe -to -toe with a DDoS for days or weeks on end knows pretty much what I mean. There's no deception open to us when we're trying to uh, win any of the, the minor skirmishes that are in the long conflict that we're in. Uh, but this stuff here is the bad guys get to do this every day, all day. In fact, they have to do this because they are not the superior force. So when we don't lose, I don't want to say that we win, but, uh, win ever, but on a day that we didn't lose, do we get to take anything away, from, away with us that will help us um, be stronger in the next conflict? I would say that the answer for us is no, but for the bad guys, uh, this talks about chariots, but I'm looking at botnets. Um, they are using networks that we build and that we pay for the link, you know, we pay for the, the dark fiber and the capital and everything else, and they're computers that uh, we bought for our parents or our children or, or whatever. Um, it's all our stuff that they need in order to execute their business model. Um, they have very little stuff of their own. To the extent that they buy stuff, it's uh, expensive houses in the French Riviera or expensive Italian sports cars. They, they, the rest of what they do, they use our stuff for. Um, so this whole augmentation thing, they get to do and we don't. Makes you wonder exactly how long we can keep doing that. It's a whole section in the art of war explaining sort of the bad things that will happen to you if you set yourself up for a lengthy campaign. Um, our campaign is not only lengthy, it is unending. 
um, their campaigns are very short. So when somebody wants to do something, they will assemble whatever team they need and whatever data and tools and so forth, and they'll buy whatever botnet or whatever they need to do, and they will send whatever spam or DDoS or and they'll do whatever they're going to do, and they'll pass it on to the next person in their economic chain, and then they're done. They turn off their computers and they go out to dinner. Um, we just have to treat this as the long war, the unending war. Again, I want to refer you to the loss and fraud budgets of the banks and credit card companies. Um, if you can convince one of these companies that the best thing for them is if they just let some percentage of the money passing through their system wind up in the wrong hands and then refund that out of some, some other sort of general set-aside, um, then you can set up a permanent system where you just get paid over and over again for doing the same stuff over and over again. Reminds me a little bit of an NPR radio program I heard about negotiating with pirates uh, off the coast of Somalia um, where after a ship is taken, then the insurance company calls up and they start talking about how much money is going to be in the suitcase full of money. I don't understand how they think that ends. You know, you none of this is about just getting through the current quarter, except the way we've organized our financial system, getting through the current quarter is the only thing that matters. Here, I was made to consider once again the quote from uh, the Conficker discussions about round to it. Uh, I'll get around to it. Once I get enough round to it, I can handle that for you. Uh, it is often possible to know how to win, but, not, but to then not be able to do it. And we are very rarely on the offensive. I know of a couple of offensive efforts um, where the, the thing, the vulnerability that we are going after is the need that these bad guys have to live in our society. Right, if you're um, you know, going to a rave somewhere and you're dancing with somebody that you're hoping to you know, take home with you uh, and, they, and they ask you, and what do you do for a living, you're probably not going to say, oh, I sell child pornography on the Internet. You know, you're going to find something else you can say. Um, and if you can't, right, if everybody was out in the open, if everything that every one of these guys did uh, was just stuck to them, um, then I suspect that the allure of this type of crime would be lower. So that's really the only, only systemic vulnerability they have is their anonymity. And so I know of some offensive efforts in that area, not just Spam House and the, the, the Roxo list, which is excellent, by the way, uh, but something you know more targeted than that um, is, is what it would take. But even then, I'm not sure how this scales. And if it's the only vulnerability that I have found and I can't think of a way to exploit it in a scalable fashion, uh, then we're pretty much still losing. And it's because we are systemically on the defensive. Can anybody look at this and not see DDoS? I just, um, we don't have a way to exploit this advice, the bad guys do. And um, we like, when we employ defenses, to think of them as constants. In other words, I think I'll install Clam AV or something, whatever it's going to be, a firewall. I'm going to go install that to protect my network, my server, whatever it is I'm going to protect. And then I'm going to move on to my next project. And I am not going to come back to this until it stops working. I am not going to continue fiddling with it forever because I would go out of business. Um, generally, it takes the technically deepest people on the team to get any of that stuff working or to fiddle with it 
And if you're spending your salary budget in that way, you're probably not going to last long. You'll end up getting bought out by somebody who didn't do that. Um, so we like to treat our uh, warfare, as they call it here, as a constant condition because that's the only thing that makes economic sense for us. I know that the bad guys are not doing that. They are treating everything we do as the next, as the starting conditions for the next round in the game. I mentioned this earlier, the bad guys have alliances. They depend on each other, but they don't have to trust each other. They can operate between uh, enough intermediaries and enough smoke screens that they are um, they're able to depend on suppliers or to be dependent on as a supplier without having to first build any kind of a trust network. They don't have to get to know each other. They don't care whether you're on the same side. As long as you can do what you say you can do, then you will get paid and they will get paid and everybody marches forward. We, on the other hand, have the burden of having to wonder, gee, are you a bad guy? that I am about, are you asking me what I know about a certain topic? How do I, how do I know that I can trust you? Uh, it's a burden we have that they don't have. So, um, the system that we have built using our superior capability uh, places us at a systemic disadvantage. Uh, the system is broken uh, to our detriment by us, by design. And, uh, and I hate that. I could have given this talk, other than the configure stuff, I could have given this talk five years ago. You should hate that. Now, um, I don't rest easily when stuff is broken. Um, sometimes that's good. Uh, right now, as of uh, this year, DNS OARC is now an independent entity, but uh, when I saw that the DNS community didn't have anything like Nanog, uh, I, I, I was one of the people who put together OARC originally, and it used to be part of ISC, but it's now an independent uh, company, and I treat it as a success. So the DNS operations mailing list and some other uh, things are, I think, important for DNS. I think we are far ahead of where we used to be because information sharing is occurring, cooperation is occurring. Um, Dwayne Wessels is here. Keith Mitchell is here. If you have any curiosity about what this is, uh, I recommend that you tackle them, get their business cards. Um, more recently, I've done this uh, thing inside of IFC called the Security Information Exchange uh, because it turns out that uh, lack of information, uh, lack of sensors, lack of a source of what's happening now or what's happened recently is the reason that many analysts and researchers and tool makers are not pushing forward. Um, I myself wrote some software. I know that that's dangerous and that I should stop, but I wrote some software called NCAP that kind of makes that go, but it's also, I think, quite usable outside of the Security Information Exchange. You should Google it. You should find it. You should test it. It's a little bit like PCAP and TCP dump, but it takes a slightly different approach. I've been involved in something called the OPSEC Trust Project. Uh, where I do some sysadmin and, once again, some coding. I know I should stop, but I can't. Uh, this is Barry Green and John Christoph and Jose from Arbor, Jose Nazario, uh, put this together as a way to share information among trusted parties. Um, if, you should, if you think that that's interesting, you should contact Jose or Barry or John and say, hey, that's interesting. Can I get involved somehow? Um, I'm here. I don't come to Nanog very often, uh, other than when it is co-located with Aaron. But I'm here. Thank you for inviting me. Uh, I'm here because this work is important, because the children in my family are going to grow up into a world that has the same damn problems that we've got if I don't get on an airplane once in a while and try and make a difference. Um, I am also working on various ways to get some funding. 
I believe that uh, if we had some round to it that were dedicated rather than stolen from day jobs and families, uh, that the good guys might be able to sort of push the line of scrimmage back toward midfield. Obviously, this is all about you. Um, if you're not running an abuse desk that responds 24 by 7, if you're not disconnecting customers first and asking questions later, um, you're part of the problem, and you're shifting your costs onto your competitors or onto the community. Um, you, you, you can't do that because that causes your competitors to have to do likewise in order to compete with you. And when they do it, your customers do suffer. You've just got to get your head out of the current quarter and look at the long-term pattern that you are contributing to. When you outsource, you not only don't have in-house expertise, and so you tend to be kind of at the mercy of the people, the vendors that you choose for your security, um, you're also contributing to their monetary inertia. In other words, when you buy security as a service rather than hiring people to create it for you inside your company, you are not incentivizing your vendors to make the problem go away permanently. You're incenting them to manage the problem and look good doing it. And you've got to think about what that means for you in the long term. And uh, last but not least, participation. Um, you're here. I appreciate the hell out of that. A fair number of you have looked up from your laptops several times during this presentation, and that's great. And I'll tell everybody back home that it was a, a rip-roaring success. Um, but you can't expect that I am somehow going to solve this problem for you. Um, not only can I not do it without you, I can't actually do it. We need to have the whole community become more aware of these patterns and of our contributions to them. Um, so you should go find out. If you don't know what NSPSEC is, you should probably go find out. Um, if, you know, if you're not on at least three secret handshake mailing lists, then you're under the curve and you need to go find some others. Um, and uh, if I put out the call for funding in this area in order to aggregate some round to it, um, I will count on some of you to say, you know, gee, that sounds interesting. Anybody want to queue up the microphone? Any questions? I'm getting the hook. No, I was just going to moderate that. We have, we have a few minutes for questions, so let's have a, a little round of applause while you all ponder. <laughs> yes, in the back. And when you come to the microphone, please uh, state your name and your favorite. No, just your name and the company you work for. Thanks. Okay. I, um, I'm Chris Woodfield. I'm with Internap. Um, a lot of the a lot of the fundamental lessons um, I find myself asking the question: Is there what is fundamentally different, or is there anything fundamentally different when it comes to the fact that we're talking about the internet and IT security uh, compared to, say, the struggles that the banks go through preventing credit card fraud or international drug interdiction agencies struggle with attempting to you know, stop the flow of illegal drugs. Um, is our struggle fundamentally different from their struggles, um, in your opinion? In my opinion, no. Uh, globalization means that uh, borders are less and less important. So just as with the uh, SARS scare of a couple of years ago, nobody really cared that there was a border between Canada and the United States. Um, and certainly the virus wasn't going to care. Crime doesn't care, whether it's drugs or phishing attacks or whatever. Um, the, uh, the, the fundamental difference as far as I'm concerned is that I can't do anything about those other problems, right? But when it comes here and it happens to us, I'd like to think we can do something about it. It may even be that if we do something about it, that uh, some of the tools that, and infrastructure and, and techniques that we build 
will be useful in those other areas. Uh, the Internet has often done things first, and the rest of the world has often learned from them. So that's the only fundamental difference is that this is the one part of the whole thing you said that we in this room could do something about. All right. Patrick? Hi, my name is Patrick. Thank you, John. I'm from Akwai. Um, during the talk, you said that if uh, you don't, uh, I'm paraphrasing you, but if you don't shoot first and ask questions later, you're part of the problem. And um, I find that I'd like you to expand upon that because uh, I think that's uh, uh, difficult to um, justify as you know, it leads to the exact opposite problem, which can be just as bad, if not worse. So uh, would you like to uh, expand a little bit on that for me, please? I would love to. Uh, the opposite problem can't scale, and that's the important thing to note. Uh, but before we get there, what I'll say is, if you get a complaint about um, some illegal content or some, maybe it's a website that looks exactly like PayPal but isn't PayPal and it's on some DSL connected computer that somebody's mother left turned on and whatever and it's running an operating system that's vulnerable to various kinds of attacks, I think the first thing that the abuse desk needs to do in that case is push the big red button that takes that thing offline. And then contact the subscriber and say, by the way, there's a problem. Or put them in a walled garden so that all of their web fetches lead to a web page that says, hey, you've got a problem, call this number. That's all I mean. I'm not saying that everybody needs a hair trigger. I'm saying that if there is a problem, you should not first stop and look at your contract with the person who you know, actually owns that co-load machine You've got to solve the problem first and then catch up to, let, let the paperwork catch up. Because if you don't, let's say it, that you're extremely good. Let's say that you know, you're uh, better than good and uh, that you can get the whole process down to two hours. The bad guys are going to look at that two hours as their window. That's their window. They will adapt to what we do. So um, if your abuse desk responds uh, by saying, here's a web form that you should fill out in order to then you know, make sure that your complaint is understandable to us, a lot of people aren't going to, aren't going to do that second step. Right. You well, may only get the first notice. So uh, two things. First of all, just so that we're clear, you get, the, you get a notice that grandma's got PayPal on her computer. So I was taking the shoot first as, okay, I'll shut down grandma, as opposed to check to make sure grandma's computer actually does have a picture of PayPal's website on it. Oh, yeah. I would okay. absolutely say, you know, check, but don't verify. Don't don't get permission on okay. this. Okay, well, in that, then that's a lot different than what I understood, so thank you okay. for sounding that. And uh, Jared would like me to point out that uh, a long time ago, EJ pointed out that a single customer support call from any customer wipes out the entire profit for that customer for an entire year. So... You're probably right that there's an issue with like going through the process because you know it puts the cost, makes the cost unbearable. But at the end of the day, I'm not sure how to solve the problem. So good luck with it. Well, so I was in the room when VJ Gill talked about um, if an AOL customer ever calls, then you know you've lost whatever profit you've lost. Um, I don't know if that's true. You know, sometimes uh, those of us in, uh, up at the microphone are guilty of some hyperbole. Um, Shocking. But um, even if it's true, that doesn't make it right because um, that, that's a form of cost shifting. What you're saying is that in order for me to grind out whatever thin margin I'm going to get, I need to be in a, a toxic polluter. I need to be in the, uh, the toxic waste business model. Um, and we can't do that. Part, mostly because it just means that your competitors have to do the same. Um, and as far as how to solve that, I don't know what the solution is. Um, I don't know if it's some combination of subsidies and penalties and licenses or, or whatever. Um, but I sure don't like where the world will go if we don't treat this as a problem and, and search for a solution for it, or I wouldn't be here. Time for one more question in the back. Dick. Dave Crocker, Brandenburg Internet Working. Um, you invoked 
two models, really. One was the superbug and the other was war. Um, on, on the war one, um, the problem is we don't really have an organized state attacking us. We have something a lot more diffuse. Um, I, I tend to prefer organized crime as the model of what we're trying to respond to. Um, but I'm, I'm intrigued on the other side with the superbug model um, because you didn't actually create that. Uh, that's just natural selection. What you did was to make it way more efficient, which is the problem with the, the antibacterial uh, hand creams. Um, and the thing with that model that is interesting to me is it's got two parts. One is the response to an attack, and the other is um, prevention of the attack, where many times prevention is a better immune system, immune systems about responding, but when the immune system is in good enough shape, you don't even see the attack. And so my question is, um, you, you've really focused a lot on the aggressive response side of things, and I'm curious whether you have any comments about the, um, the prevention or protection at levels which end up not even seeing the attack. Of course, a lot of the attacks that we don't see are probes, and maybe the attacker moves elsewhere, or maybe the attacker comes back later looking different. Um, so not seeing it is not a panacea. Um, a lot of the stuff that we use on the Internet, these protocols, these tools, these uh, network stacks, uh, evolved in an academic environment where everybody else on the network was trusted. Um, so I have frequently referred to them as laboratory-grade protocols because um, they really do work well when it's a bunch of cooperating uh, hackers around a, a table with a you know a hub in the middle. I don't necessarily scale. Um, the original work on firewalls caused a firestorm of protest from people who said, no, IP is supposed to be end-to-end. -end. Um, I want you to try to imagine sort of how secure you think that computers would be if they didn't have firewalls. Um, in other words, the current present-day scenario is not the worst possible one. Um, people have said the same thing about NAP. They've said the same thing about uh, Everything that solved some problem for somebody uh, turned out to be a violation of, of somebody's idea of what the original model was. Uh, fortunately, we're in the commercial phase of all of this, so people are pretty realistic about doing whatever they have to do in order to uh, grow revenue and build businesses and, and so forth. And so a lot of the purists are starting to uh, kind of go away and shake their heads in disgust and say, well, we're not going to get end to end in, in the format I had, had envisioned. Um, I was such a purist for a long time, so I'm, I'm, I don't mean to throw stones at others. We obviously have to have better tools. Um, we just cannot keep pushing this consumer-grade stuff out and hoping for the best. Uh, my problem with that is that better tools often come along with other things that are good for the companies providing those tools. You know, I'm sure Microsoft and Apple would be happy to produce laptops that were utterly secure because every binary would have to be signed by them so that you could no longer get your software from third parties. Um, you know, DRM is a solution to the malware problem. It just happens to be even worse. Um, so other than to note that uh, the purists don't really hold very much sway, and that we have got to have better tools. I don't have a uh, pithy answer to, to Mr. Crocker's question. All right, and on that note, thank you very much. Thank you. We are at a break. There uh, should be something to eat and something to recaffeinate. Uh, we'll be back here in 30 minutes. Thanks.